those of you who are listening to me, you're going to hear me both ways. You're going to hear me on the Reading Circle as well as I also use clips of this in the Mark Medley Show. So whether you're listening on the Mark Medley Show or you're listening here on the Reading Circle, either way, what I'm about to say is pertinent to something that I say every week on the Reading Circle. As those of you who listen to the Reading Circle, you know I close out every show with... May you live as long as you want and not lo- want as long as you live. Live each day as if it were your last because one day it will be. And what, when I say that, I'm trying to get to is, you know, whatever time you have on the face of the earth, the things that you enjoy doing that you really love to do and have a passion about, make sure you get that in. So the second part of why my voice sounds like this, as I was about to say, is I play on a softball team. I played softball this year on the fall season. Had not played in some years. Always loved the game of baseball and softball as a child. Played it frequently as a child and even in some respects as an adult. So over the last few years, there's been a softball league within the school district between various principals and schools. And it's the adults. It's not the kids. It's the teachers and anybody else who wants to play. So every year, a a principal puts out the call to let know that the season is kicking off. Do you want to put your school in? So every year, I try to get players from my school to play, teachers from my school to play, and nobody plays. And I always want to play. So this year, whenever they put that email out and nobody from my school wanted to play, I sent the email back saying, look, any team who wants an extra player, who needs more players, please let me know. And first come, first serve, whoever it is, I'll play for your team. So sure enough, one of the principals at another school immediately sent me an email back saying, brother, we'll take you. And it just happened to be my fraternity brother as as it stands, coincidentally. But he said, brother, we'll take you. So I said, I'm in. So the season started back early September, and we've been playing every Friday at 4 o'clock. Usually the games go, you know, by the time we start, it's 4.15, 4.30, 4.35, whatever it is. Usually the games run till about 6 o'clock in the evening on a Friday. Well, this team over the years had, you know, a so-so record. But this year, we put together a group of players, and we were ragtag. We looked like the bad news bears. But as it turns out, we wound up winning the championship within the league and our last game was on yesterday and oh what a game it was the final score was 9-8 but the entire seven innings the game went back and forth back and forth back and forth in terms of who held the lead until literally the last inning and we were the home team so we were the last up And we ultimately wound up winning the game 9-8. But as we went into the bottom of that seventh inning, the team that we were playing, they were ahead of us 8-6. And we got up for our last inning and ultimately wound up coming back and winning the game 9-8. So my voice is raspy from yelling at that as well as yelling at our students. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but more so probably from yelling last night after we actually had won that game. And I'm sharing all that to say is I just share with you, it's a game that I've loved to play as a child. I love, it was a game, baseball, softball, I loved to play as a kid. I can remember vividly my summers that I spent down in South Boston, Virginia, in Halifax County. Where I would go down there, you know, the kids that lived down there, they played all the time, so it was no big deal to them. But for me to go down there and actually be in a large field of grass, because I played baseball up here in the city on a field full of rocks and glass. Matter of fact, we had the name, it was called Rocky Stadium. So we played on a field of rocks and glass. So for me to go down south and have literally a green field of grass, just like they have in the major leagues, that was a treat for me. So for the kids that I went, my cousins and everybody that was down there to go, I came down there, it was like, what's the big deal? We play down here all the time. I would go down there and get the lawnmower out and cut the field because they would look at me like, you know what, you see how high that grass is? We're not going out there. I would go get the lawnmower and I'd cut it. Okay, what's the excuse now? Let's play. And so when all was said and done, they didn't have a choice. So we wound up every year I'd go down there playing softball. I played softball, you know, on different leagues. Whenever I worked for AT&T, we had, again, those same type of little intramural divisional type teams played for them for a couple of years. But since I'd been in education, had not played other than an occasional game with some friends. But this year played in that little league And I'm telling you, I cannot, I said to them last night, words cannot express the fun that I had 
in, in, in this season, in the fall season. And they said, well, we have a spring league, too. I said, I'm in. So, you know, still have life, health, and strength. God grants life, health, and strength by in the spring. I intend to play in the spring league as well. But I'm, I'm saying all this, and I'm sharing this whole story with you. And I'm going to share a couple of stories with you between 9 and 7 o'clock. Because that is something that I love. And one of the things people always ask me, I don't understand how you have so much energy to do this, that, and the other. Because most of the things that I do, I have a passion for. And the, the easiest way for you to do a lot of things or to have a lot of energy is to do something that you have a passion for. You should not be dragging yourself down. And that's what I think Iyana was trying to get about the energy. And I also a little bit in Joyce Meyer's book, too. If you're putting your energy into something that you don't like or something that you hate, you're going to wind up creating or receiving negative energy. If you're constantly doing something that you hate or that's drudgery for you, that's going to create negativity. That is going to make you use more energy because you're constantly doing something that you don't like or don't want to do. So the answer for most people when they ask me is, I don't understand how you do so much. Where does all this energy come from? Where does this, that, and the other come from? It's because most of the things that I do, if not all, is something that I'm very passionate about. So in terms of energy, I don't even think about with the energy that's being expended. It doesn't phase me because i'm doing what i love to do and literally as they say the time really does fly when you're having fun whenever you're doing what you love to do you don't even have to worry about looking at the clock the only time the clock drags is when you're doing something that you don't want to be doing when you're doing something that you don't want to be doing you can look at the clock and it'll say seven o'clock and then the next time you look it says 703 and it feels like five hours have gone by <laughs> And I mean it because every now and again, I have been in situations where I'm doing something that I really don't enjoy. And I'll be looking at the clock saying, when is this over? And like I said, it'll be seven o'clock when I look at it the first time, look at it again it's 7.03 and feel like five hours have gone by. But it is the reverse when you're doing something that you love to do. So, for instance, on the nights we're out there on that softball field, it don't even feel like an hour and a half. I mean, I can bring it home even here. Whenever I'm here on Saturday mornings, because I love to do this, it doesn't even feel like three hours have gone by. I come in, we go on the air at six, we go back off. For me, I leave the studio at nine. It does not feel like three hours. And I guarantee you, if I were to talk to Barry or anybody else who's up here, they would tell you the same thing. So whatever it is that you would like to do, do not hesitate because we don't know how long we have here. We don't know how long we're going to be on the planet. So rather than constantly doing drudgery, and even if you have to do some drudgerous things, some things that are, are drudgery for you, even if you have to do a couple, don't let that be the bulk of what you do. Don't let that be the majority of your lifetime is doing something that you hate. And if it, even if something that is a passion for you becomes something that you're beginning to not like or hate, it's time to get out of it. Because one thing I can truly say now, I may linger a little bit into time of something I hate, but eventually I do get out of it. And that hence is what happened whenever I, I moved over from my corporate life into education. I had some really good years in corporate America. I cannot complain. Really good years. Traveled the country, met all kinds of famous people, learned all kinds of skills, did all kinds of things. But after about the 14th, 13th, 14th year, I was moving into more and more assignments that were becoming drudgery for me. They were number assignments, number crunching assignments. And every day I was beginning to get up and go to work, like really hating to go to work and that's not a good feeling those last couple of years the more assignments that i got that that dealt with me having to crunch numbers and figure out sales and, and this this that and the other the more i hated it and that's when i knew it was time to go and around that same time was whenever i started teaching at the college level i started teaching a course at fairly dickinson university on the madison campus and that was one night a week it was thursday nights and during that time frame, during that semester, I could not wait for Thursdays. Thursdays could not come for me quick enough because I knew I was going to be teaching that night. And I would come in every Friday morning talking about how great 
Thursday night was and how I couldn't wait for the next Thursday and how much I love teaching. And when I was at AT AT&T, I had an office mate because there was two of us in an office and her name was Grace Ann. I will not forget. And I think I've shared this story on the air before. Every morning I would come in telling Grace Ann about my wonderful time the night prior and she, she knew, because we had talked before, that I really love teaching. So finally, one day, Grace Ann said, Mark, why don't you go take that damn teacher's test? That's a quote, quote, unquote. That's what she said. She turned around. She looked at me. Mark, go take that damn teacher's test. And at that point, I said, you know what, Grace Ann, you're right. And that's whenever I signed up for the praxis. That's whenever I made the decision and I signed up for the teaching test, which was the praxis. And the rest, as they say, is history. The rest, I can tell you, was the movement of the hand of God. No doubt, no question. I don't have to be ashamed of that. I don't have to equivocate without a doubt from the point. As a matter of fact, even Grace Ann saying that was a part of the hand of God because she was used as an angel. She was used as the messenger. Those words, Mark, go take that damn teacher's test. So she was used as a messenger. She was a part of the hand of God. And surely enough, I did go take the teacher's test and it's led up to everything or where I am today. But again, it was something that I love to do. Teaching, reading, writing, speaking, all of those things I absolutely love to do. And when I'm doing them, there is no such thing as time for me. So the same holds true with softball or baseball. At one point, I, I really used to like to watch baseball. I don't really watch baseball too much anymore. And I can remember whenever I was a student here at William Patterson during my undergrad days back in the 80s. I had a professor, a psychology professor, and he says, I don't understand why anybody would watch baseball. I don't see why anybody would watch baseball. I think that's stupid. And I was offended because at that time I was watching baseball. I was offended by his commentary when he said that. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? You know, if you watch baseball, that's stupid. But over the years, I know I understand now what he meant, because after we had a talk, he did explain. He said, I can see playing the game. I can see if you're a participant. I can see if you're actually out there on that field playing. Said, but what I can't see is somebody sitting down watching somebody else play. And in terms of baseball over the years, my views have shifted. I tend to now agree with him. Now, it doesn't hold true for football because <laughs> football I still watch. I have no problem watching football, but baseball, I just, it is for me to watch now, especially on TV. Maybe when I go to a live game, it's a little bit different, but on television, it is just too slow for me to watch. I didn't even watch the World Series. I understand it was one of the best series we ever had between the Dodgers and the Astros. And so, but I didn't, I didn't watch one game of the World Series. Now I knew what was going on through social media and through reports on the radio, but I didn't watch one World Series game, but I love the game of baseball. My, my team is the Yankees has been since I was 12 still. Congratulations to all you Houston Astro fans. For me, even that seems weird because growing up, the Houston Astros was in the national league. They were a National League team. They were in the same league the Dodgers were in. They were in the National League. But over time, things have shifted, and Houston now is in the American League. So they won the American League title and ultimately the World Series. But even that, just hearing that, that the Dodgers and Astros was in the World Series sounded strange to me because I grew up with them in the same league, which was the National League. So... Back to what my professor said, in terms of me watching baseball on television, I I tend to agree with him because I usually wind up falling asleep or either my attention span is not that into watching a long baseball game. Football is a little bit different. And maybe one day (laughs) my attitude may shift toward that either because every now and again, my wife finds me on the couch sleep and the football game going as well. But Back to my original premise, which is do something that you love to do. And it doesn't have to be just one thing because that's the other thing. People sometimes think they can only do one thing. And again, I come at you from the standpoint that life is too short to only do one thing and to enjoy one thing, to only love one thing. You need to get out there and do as much as you can while you can. Because one day you you're going you can't and you're going to wish you can. <laughs> so do what you can while you can, because one day you won't be able to and you wish you can. So and that's kind of the way I kind of run for me. That's why I'm, I'm able to do this. And so this this since let me see, August, September, 
I've had, I'm back into like a really aggressive schedule again and it can be tiring, but I love it. On Monday nights, something can come up one way or the other. So I may be out on a Monday night. Tuesday nights, I teach a class here at William Patterson. I teach radio news. Wednesday night, I go to Bible study. Thursday night, I teach a public speaking class. Friday night, I played softball. So every night of the week, I was out. My wife, her schedule was just as crazy because she's in school working on her MBA. So she's doing projects with her classmates, doing things with her church. So we're literally passing each other. It's tiring, but it's a good tiring because I'm doing things that I love. And the other thing is like when if I'm not doing that, I'll be home in my office and on my computer, I have simulators. I have a truck driving simulator. I have a race car driving simulator. I have a bus driving simulator. I have a ship simulator. And ultimately, my favorite, of course, is the flying of the airplanes. I have an airline simulator. And I will get on those simulators and they are so realistic that it's not funny. When I tell you that the the technology today makes you feel like you're actually flying a plane or you're actually driving a truck, you really can't tell too much of the difference other than the size And if you buy a big enough screen, you might not even be able to tell that a big enough monitor. But other than that, you really can't tell the difference between when you're really doing it and when you're on the simulator. So I will go on there and I'm flying 747s, 737s, fighter jets, Lear jets, Cessnas. I'm literally going from place to place, from city to city, flying these planes. And it feels just as if I was doing it for real. Same thing with American Truck Simulator. You get in that game and it does everything as if you were a tractor trailer driver. You have to hook up the trailer. You get on various highways. It has a GPS system. You plug in the map from one city to another. Now, the one difference is with the airline or with with flight simulator, it flies in real time. So if the flight is a 45 minute flight or an hour flight from here to Boston or here to Washington, you sit there in real time. The truck simulator It doesn't use real time, but it's close. So say, for example, to go a thousand miles, you're going to sit there about an hour and a half, an hour 15 to go a thousand miles. But as you're working your way through the roads, you're hitting traffic, you're hitting accidents, you're hitting detours, you're hitting everything you would hit if you were really driving. Now, for me, I love it. The simulators for me are very relaxing because people say, well, what do you do to relax? I, I drive simulators. I fly on a simulator. I, you know, I command a cruise ship on the simulator. I, I do the racing car. I, I race, I drag race or either stock car race with the simulators. And all those things are very relaxing to me. So my wife knows exactly where to find me. If I'm not somewhere out in the yard reading or out on the porch reading or in one of these other things that I described for you, then I'm down in my office on one of the simulators. But I'm saying all that to say when I say live life to the fullest, that's what I'm talking about. Not just sitting around like a couch potato watching TV all day. And for those who like TV, you know what? I'm not knocking you, but I can tell you now TV is nothing but a, a brain drain. If that's all you're doing for hour after hour after hour after hour. If you sit there from 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning and you're watching show after show after show until 10, 11, 12 at night, that's just a brain drain. Oddly enough, that is the way I read books, because that's the other question people ask me all the time that I know we've talked about on the show. is How do you get through so many books? Well, the same way somebody will sit down and watch a 30 minute sitcom or either an hour reality show, the same way I sit down and read a book. Same difference, same amount of time, same hour. So for the 30 minutes that you're watching whatever sitcom that you watch or an hour watching, you know, Graves Anatomy or whatever is the same way that I read a book and I'll read 30 minutes for one book. Stop that one. Go to another book. Read 30 minutes in that one. Stop that one. Read another one for 30 minutes. Stop that one. Read another one for 30 minutes. So that's two hours that I've spent maybe reading and I've started or I've gone through four books in each half hour. So if two hours is four half hours then I have read something in four different books, the same way you've watched four different television shows. That's how I get through so many books. So whatever it is, live life to the fullest because we don't know when, which it gives me a segue into the next portion I wanted to talk about. On Tuesday morning, eight people, Actually, more than eight. All of us woke up on Tuesday morning, but eight people 
woke up and these Pacific eight, they made the news because they were more than them who woke up and didn't, didn't make it to the end of the day or didn't wake up the next day. But these eight were highlighted because they were killed. They were killed by now a, what we can call a terrorist. They were out there on a bike path on the West side highway in New York when this nut, this animal, this, I don't know what you want to call him, takes a truck that he rented and goes on that bath bike path and starts mowing people down. Eight people were killed. Oddly enough, only two of them were American. Six out of the eight was from another country who were just enjoying a beautiful fall weather day. You heard me talk earlier about how beautiful the weather has been this fall. So they were out there on that bike path enjoying a wonderful weather, fall weather day. They got up that morning, didn't give any thoughts to that. It would be their last day on the face of the earth was out doing something they enjoyed doing, which was riding their bicycles. A couple of them, I think one of them or two of them were actually on their lunch hour from work, had their bicycle, decided to go out for those, for the hour or so they had, and to ride the bike. And lo and behold, they would not make it back. They would literally not make it back because someone went in there with a truck and was running over them as if they were nothing. Now, that's crazy. It really is. It really is that you can just sit there and mow lives down. And ultimately, what stopped this madman was a school bus. I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, and I got to make sure I have the story straight, but I think the school bus saw what was going on and cut him off. And he hit the school bus broadside and there were kids in there. They got injured, too, but they didn't get killed. But just the thought. And then he has the nerve the audacity, as you hear the reports say in the beginning, he was going to put ISIS flags on the truck, but he thought that would draw too much attention to himself. But he still is in the hospital requesting an ISIS flag to be put in his room. Now, there's very few, very few times since Trump has been president that I've agreed with him. But every now and again, we do agree. And in this case, and, you know, again, the views and opinions heard on this show are solely those of the host and guest. But in this case, I kind of sort of agree with Trump in terms of sending him to Gitmo or sending him to Guantanamo Bay. I kind of sort of agree with that. And believe me, I know, you know, I know we can't do eye for an eye, evil for evil. I know that. But at the same time, folks need to connect some consequences to actions. So I'm not saying that we send him down to Gitmo or Guantanamo Bay to kill him, per se. But at the same time, whatever happened, happens. So there's a part of me that kind of sort of agrees with President Trump when he says, you know what, I'm, I'm thinking about sending them down to Gitmo. I'm thinking about sending them down to Guantanamo Bay. Because think about it, that don't make any sense. These are people that had absolutely nothing to do with him or ISIS or anybody else, anything. I think six, five, I think five of the, the gentlemen that got killed were over here celebrating a class reunion. It was maybe four or five of them, something like because it was like only two Americans and then six folks from overseas or other parts of the world. And it was a female, and I believe the rest of them were men. One female, seven men. And I believe of the seven men, five of them or four of them were here touring the U.S. and New York celebrating a 30 or 40-year class reunion. Now, they lost their lives, had nothing to do with ISIS, had nothing to do with this man, had nothing to do with anything other than they're out there on that bike path enjoying a nice bike ride. And they lost their lives. So there is a part of me that don't have a problem with this guy being sent to Gitmo. There is. I'm just sorry. I mean, it may sound cruel. It may sound harsh. It may sound anti-Christian. It may sound whatever. I don't know. But all I know is there got to be some consequences to the actions and uh, you know not for nothing our system is very slow with that now i know we are innocent until proven guilty but our system is very slow and so we're going to house this guy for a long time before anything occurs so now if we have to house him and he gets housed in gitmo or he gets housed in guantanamo bay then so be it but again those folks did not know that that was going to be their last day on the planet 
We don't know when it's going to be our last day on the planet. So whatever it is that you love to do, please, I keep encouraging you. And at the end, for those listening on the Mark Medley Show, I invite you to tune in on Saturday mornings from 6 to 9 on gobrave.org and to WP 88.7 FM. And for those of you who listen weekly, you're listening right now, you know I encourage you at the end of each show to... Live as long as you want, not want as long as you live. Live each day as if for your last, because one day it will be, you know, live your life to the fullest. That's where I'm going there. All right. All right. That's, you know, pretty much what I'm going to say on that. A couple more things before we get out. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. And again, I use clips of this show because I do record it, and I actually use them as a part of the Mark Medley Show, because not only do I do the radio here on Saturday mornings, I have a podcast, and that's what it's called. It's the Mark Medley Show, and a lot of times, particularly in the first hour when I'm doing the commentary, I will use the same commentary that I'm doing here. I will do the editing and make that a part of the Mark Medley Show and send that out as a part of the podcast. So you can catch that show on all the major sites. I mean, if they distribute podcasts, most likely you can catch the Mark Medley Show on it, especially the majors. We're talking Spreaker, we're talking Stitcher, we're talking iHeartRadio, we're talking YouTube, we're talking Apple Music or iTunes or whatever they used to call themselves. On all the majors, you can catch my podcast there, The Mark Medley Show, and it is similar. Matter of fact, the podcast, I'm going to go home and edit this and send it out as The Mark Medley Show, what I just talked about in terms of, of following your passions, in terms of this crazy man that mowed down all these people. And then this segment, as I get prepared for our guests in the 7 o'clock hour, I will, I will share, you know, some observations because one of the things I'm very observant. People don't think so, but I really am. I observe things. And, and when I observe things, I don't observe things from the standpoint that many may observe when they're observing, if they observe. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Every morning, I mean, I'm, I'm very routine and regimented oriented in terms of, you know, things that I got to get done. So I know on Saturday mornings, I have to prepare myself to get here by a certain time. And I need to give myself enough time to get everything set up in the studio because I'm the first show on Saturday mornings. So everything usually is either on automation or either is turned off. So I have to get here in enough time to get everything turned on, up and running, off automation, on the manual, so forth and so on. So at a certain amount of time, a certain time I have to leave the house. And there's certain things that I do between getting to the studio and leaving the house. And one of them is stopping by my local coffee house, which for us is Dunkin' Donuts. So I stopped there everywhere. about the same time, somewhere around 5, 5.15, 5.20 or so, I hit there. Now this morning, as I did my usual routine, and usually as I'm coming up, because to get to the studio, it's a, a grade, a, a hill. William Patterson sits on top of a hill. And the grade to get up here, even on car, you can hear your cars kind of straining coming up the hill. You can, you can hear it take its toll on cars as they're coming up. And to do it by bicycle, of which I have done, it is, it is a challenge. Now, it's not the biggest hill we've ever gone up, but it's a long grade. It's a long, steady grade. And speaking of bicycles, that bike path I was talking about over in New York on the West Side Highway, I've been on that bike path. I have ridden my bike on that bike path. I know exactly where those people were killed as I have been bike riding. And me and whoever I was riding with, we went that particular path on that particular day on West Side Highway. So I know exactly. That's another reason why this is personal for me in terms of bikers, because I'm a cyclist. I ride my bicycle. That's another passion. So I know exactly on West Side Highway where that was because I've been there with my bicycle. But going back to my story here. So every morning that I'm coming up. I see this gentleman, he'll be walking his bike because it's a grade. And as it turns out, this morning I had the opportunity to see him up because he stopped in the Dunkin' Donuts as well. As it turns out, it's an older gentleman, an older Hispanic gentleman. I don't know of which descent. I don't know Mexican, Dominican, Cuban, Colombian. I don't know which one. I couldn't really tell. But he was an older gentleman. And you know, you all know how I go on these rants about ripped jeans, about how it just makes absolutely no sense to me that someone with any kind of good mind would walk into a store and buy something that's already damaged. I don't care what anybody says. Something with a rip or tear in it is now damaged. So we're going to walk up to the counter. And you're going to pay probably even more money, premium money, because it's ripped, which really makes no sense to me. But we have those out there that do that. 
Now, if you're one that do that and you're in the listening audience, then so be it. But it doesn't make any sense to me. So as I see this older man, he actually was in front of me. He actually wound up being in front of me. And I didn't realize that he got to the Dunkin' Donuts. He got there on his bike before I got there on the car because I saw him. And mind you, it's five something in the morning. And right now, because of time, it's dark in the morning this time. So I saw his reflector. I saw his little light beaming and everything. He gets there and I says, older Hispanic man. So that's the first thing that caught my eye. But the second thing that caught my eye was I, I was behind him. So I saw a rip in his jeans, but it was where he carries his phone or his wallet or something in his back pocket. And that's the only rip that was on there. And what came to my mind was... Now, see, that's not a rip that he bought. That was a rip due to wear. That was a rip due to being worn. And since he rides that bicycle, because the other thing that came to my mind was, oh, my God, this man most likely, I will bet you, was either coming from or most likely going to work. And that was his mode of transportation. And that's when it hit me how things, how we take things for granted. Here I have a car and I'm able to come in every morning and my car comes up that hill and I come into the parking lot. And this man has to ride his bike every day because most likely he does not own a car or cannot get a license or doesn't have a license or whatever the situation for me. But what came to me was how many things we take for granted. I take for granted just going out to my car, starting up. Put the key in, start up, get in, get warm, drive. Or if it's on a summer day, get in, turn the key, turn the air conditioner on, drive. But here this man is, older gentleman, most likely going to a menial type job on his bicycle. And his jeans are ripped because of work, not because of some fashion statement, not because he's gone up to some cash register and paid money for something that's already damaged. His jeans was ripped in that one spot around the pocket where I could see it was probably from whatever he was carrying in there, whether it's a wallet or a phone or whatever, because he had his backpack on his back as well. He had his backpack. I mean, you would have to picture this. I, I almost, I mean, as my mother always can say, you know, it almost bring tears to your eyes. Well, it does, kind of, it would, if you observed the way I observed and saw things from the eyes that I see it in, it would make you almost well up. In terms of what we're talking about earlier with gratitude. And all I could say was thank God. Thank you know, first I thank God that I have a car, but I thank God at least that he had a bike. Because to someone who don't have the bike that's just walks everywhere they go, they would wish they had the bike. There's a there's a cartoon or 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 story or something along that lines of someone who is barefooted looks upon a person who has shoes with with like wow i wish i had a pair of shoes and someone who now has shoes and the only transportation they have are those shoes and walking they look at somebody that have a bicycle and say wow wow if only i had a bicycle and then you have somebody who has a bicycle that's looking at somebody with a car that says wow if only i could get a car so i mean we really have a lot to be grateful and thankful for those of us because there's just so much we take for granted so I looked at it. first off, the other thing is like, I'm, and I'm kind of quirky, I'm kind of weird, but just for me to see somebody eating alone, kind of like, it just looks sad to me. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with anything else, but it just, for somebody to see somebody eating alone by themselves, it just always looks sad to me for some reason. So the same gentleman, I see him eating his donut and his coffee and he finishes and he gets on his bike and now, and I get out at the same time, I'm driving up here, he's walking the bike up the hill because as I said, it is a, it is a tough grind. It is. I have a 21, 24, 25 speed bike. And even on my bike, because I have a racing bike, I have a thousand plus dollar bike. Even on my bike, that grade is tough. Now, this man's bike is nowhere near the cost of that. And I see him every Saturday morning pushing that. But what again, what came to my mind was that's the man I see every Saturday morning as I'm coming into the studio. I got a chance to see him up close and personal. But the point, the moral of the story is, we need to be grateful. We have got to be thankful and grateful and not be so in the mindset of somebody owes something and the mindset that we're entitled of the mindset of anything. Because truth be told, we don't have to have any of it. God didn't have to bless us with any of it. When it all comes down and when it's all said and done, these things that we have, we didn't have to have. Them. And again, truth be told, 
when we're done and it's over, these things are still going to be here. When that man mowed those people down the other day, now the bicycles were damaged, but they were still here. The people were gone. The people riding those bicycles were gone. But those bicycles, even though they were they were broken from being hit by a truck, but that bicycle was still here. I don't care if you're a millionaire, billionaire, quillionaire, zillionaire. Every last dollar is going to stay here when your time is up. So it doesn't pay us to have our nose stuck up in the air. It does not pay us to have our head held high looking down on somebody else. It does not pay us to be thinking we're so much better than anybody else. I did not see myself better as that Hispanic man in there today. I really didn't. I didn't see myself better as me having a car and him having a bike. I didn't see myself any better as him now traveling with his backpack on a bicycle with a pair of legitimately ripped jeans and not something that you bought with some silly fashion statement. I did not see myself better than him i saw us as equals and i just thank god for the fact that i was able to get a car and who knows maybe he's choosing not to have a car looks like my guests are calling in hang on a second maybe he's choosing not to have a car i don't know so hang on all right they're gonna call in again every now and again this phone the connectivity it it, it gets a little crazy so they're gonna call back in but as i was saying maybe maybe he's choosing not i doubt it It's probably something more along the lines of he looks like he was an immigrant, so he may not be able to get a license or he's older, chooses not to have one, can't have one. But he had the bicycle. So at least he was grateful and using that to the best of his ability, because to pull if he unless this is a weekend job to pull this hill is no joke. And if he does that every day, he's trying to get to a job. He's going to somebody's job. He's going to work. And there are those who don't even do that much. Won't even get up and go. 